combat design. What does a combat encounter entail? So let's go over the different aspects. First of all, PCs. Then we have enemies. We have terrain. We have weather. And then we have resources. These different aspects are things you have to really think about before you make any combat encounter. So the first thing you want to start with is PCs. What are the PCs? I will give you a very basic form. The first thing you want to do is you want to calculate player effective HP and its threshold. What is player effective HP? Player effective HP represents the average amount of hit points that your players are going to have versus what their HPR is. HPR in this case stands for healing per round and also mitigation effects, which can add to prevented damage. So what you want to do is you want to do average HP pooled plus the HPR plus mitigation, and then you want to add in shielding. That's your effective HP threshold. Why does that matter? Well, when you understand how many hit points your players have, then you can calculate how much damage they can take and therefore how deadly your encounter can be. So when you have your player HP, there's other different things you have to calculate like average AC, average common save, uh, average mobility, because mobility is very important to calculate what distances there are because if you have a melee a heavy party and you make the arena big, depending on how big you make it, uh, they are that many times less effective than a ranged character. And then, after you've done all of that, average player experience. Now, this next one's a little bit more, you know, open-ended because averaging player experience means that more experienced players are more likely to do more uh, optimized actions and less experienced players are more likely to do less optimized actions. And you have to keep that in mind whenever you're designing your encounter. I'll give you guys an example of this. Pride of the Nightwolf, I basically tuned all of the encounters up by approximately 25%, comparatively speaking, because the DM group, since they are experienced, they're more likely to act efficiently. And that is something that did happen. That's the very simplified version of what I do for player characters in every combat encounter before I make it. What about luck? What about luck? All of this stuff is calculated off of averages, like statistical averages. So you cannot calculate and control everything, and that's the point. The dice decide who wins, but you can calculate everything else. And like I was saying also, this is the very simplistic form of this. So this doesn't calculate things like wild magic. This doesn't calculate things like synergy. This doesn't calculate those types of things. I'm trying to make this video for people who are just starting. I don't want to overwhelm them. So you have to start with something like very basic so that they can understand that. And as time goes on, they'll learn more. I might even do an advanced version video for this type of setup. But like I said, I like a lot of you are like, how do you calculate this? It's like, well, some of that won't be accounted for in the basic guide. <laughs> so I need to make sure that it's digestible. All right, so now I want to move on to enemies. What do I calculate for enemies? You have to calculate the enemy threshold. You have to calculate fight pacing. You want to look for an average of about five rounds. And then to calculate enemy AC, you want to accommodate player attack bonus, including rate of advantage. ROA, or rate of advantage, is how often can this group produce advantage? Uh, the next thing that you want to do, uh, you need to calculate DPR, and then you need to accommodate for AOE and for burst. AOE represents a much higher rate of damage to the overall player threshold, like to their HP threshold. So, Sunder and Haruko are attacking an enemy. If I hit Sunder and hit him for 10 damage, that is less effective than if I used Fire, like Burning Hands, and I hit Haruko and Sunder for 5 damage apiece. Now, I did the same amount of damage to the HP threshold, but the area of effect damage is worse because it's less effective to be healed. It's harder to heal that. So, remember that AoE is always more effective than single target, even if it does less damage. Now, there is a point to when that's not true, because if I hit 
fucking Sunder with 20 damage, and then I do 5 damage to both of them, the 20 damage is obviously worse. If you're able to knock down a character's health past a certain threshold point, then that means that not only will players panic more often, but that means that it is more likely for them to go down as the rounds tick. Now, what is burst? Burst is if you have critical hit effects. If you're using a creature with sneak attack, right? The critical hit of a creature with sneak attack will outpace the critical hit of an enemy using a greatsword. But then finally, after you calculate that, then you calculate DLT and auras. So DLT and auras fall under the line of intrinsic damage. If I cast a spell on somebody and I say, okay, like Witch Bolt, you're going to take a D12 at the start of your turn, period, right? That's unavoidable intrinsic damage, which means that their HP threshold is permanently scaled down for as long as that is. That damage is stackable over time, and it is the worst out of all of them. Stackable damage is very fucking dangerous, and that's why I use it very little. Because stackable damage keeps people ticking down, and it's not really avoidable. And this is also true of auras, which... Auras technically aren't damage over time in terms of, like, a tick-down effect, but auras represent the area of effect version of a singular DLT. And in spells like Spirit Guardians, it's literally both. And then you calculate enemy positioning. Uh, so enemy positioning is not quite the same as mobility because you are far less likely to move as an enemy than a player is to move. Now, why is that? Well, <clears throat> generally speaking, enemies are fighting creatures that won't die as easy as they will. So the reason that a player, more often than not, needs to move is if they move on to a new target. It is less likely that an enemy will need to move to hit a target once it's already engaged that target. But this is where the other part is different because the enemy positioning is more important than the player positioning because player positioning is going to change rapidly throughout the combat. Whereas enemy positioning, unless it is a specific mechanic, is not going to change a lot. Enemies are going to stay planted in the various places that they're going to be in more often than not. So you have to make sure that their positioning is placed in the appropriate way that makes sense to the storytelling. So, for example, if they're a disorganized band of kobolds that have no military training and they're just a bunch of wild, random, like, savages running out with spears, they are likely going to be sporadically placed. They're not going to be in a tight formation with people with shields and meat at the front and with casters in the back. They're not going to be tactical. They're going to swarm and they're probably going to attack the first creature that they run into. The reason you have these design aspects is that they represent the story you're telling in combat. And that's a very big thing I want to get into. You're always role-playing and you're always storytelling and combat is no different. Save calculation slash skill calculation. Follow a precedent medium. So this is something that is a little more controversial to some people, but I don't use attributes to determine saves. Uh, I determine saves and skills based off of relevance to that creature type. Because generally speaking, spells that use saves uh, psychologically are worse when they fail than when a player rolls badly. Because it is much worse when an enemy rolls well. So what I tend to do is, is I don't give the baseline of statistical improvements across the board. I focus like a boss might have a well medium across the board of all the saves. And if it has relevance to the story, I'll give them a focus in the save. Or generally speaking, I don't give save bonuses at all to like minion characters. I don't give minions bonuses unless it's relevant somehow. I want the characters that use save-based mechanics to land them. Uh, now, I want to talk about the next really important piece of encounter design, and that's terrain. Let me tell you something, there's nothing I regret more than watching a DM not use terrain. Terrain is so important. Terrain can set the entire pace of a fight. Are you fighting over a river? I want to see river mechanics. I want to see difficult terrain. I want to see a bridge. I want to see people use that shit. Are you fighting in a city? Oh man, I want to see you use the city for cover, to use the various objects, to roll underneath wagons and all kinds of stuff. One of the best representations is Lost at Sea used terrain to their advantage all the time. So, use it. Uh, designate cover, difficult terrain, height, water mechanics, and vehicles, plus hazards. You got all those different things that you get to calculate. 
what's going to make this fight dynamic? Okay, you can take cover behind these barrels. You can climb on top of the roof to get a height advantage to be able to see more enemies and see them earlier. You can dive into the river to avoid getting shot by arrows or to avoid the fire mages from being able to hit you. You can jump on top of the wagon and rein in the horse and start riding the, the, the vehicle through the battlefield. You can kick the fucking guy in, you know, off the roof and into the fiery hay bale below. You know, all kinds of stuff that you can do. But don't players usually ignore that stuff? Well, let me answer you. The reason they ignore it is because DMs don't implement it. If a DM starts using enemies that implement the terrain, you know what the player's reaction is? To implement the terrain. All you have to do is demonstrate that terrain matters and they'll use it. All right, and this one, weather. So this is probably one of the most ignored aspects of a combat encounter, period. Now, the thing about weather is it's not something that you can use all the time. Weather is, well, it's weather. I mean, it's not always going to be raining. It's not always going to be shining with the sun and all that good stuff. But you can add aspects like rain, for example, can mess with visibility, can make ranged attacks have a less of a chance to hit. Powerful winds can interfere with characters' ability to speak to each other. Snow is a huge one, dude. A, a fight in the snow can be so different than a fight outside of snow. Time of day is also underneath weather, by the way. So fighting at dawn with the sun rising can be a great like aspect to like blind an enemy or, or fighting at the sunset where you're fighting a bunch of creatures that get stronger at night and slowly the sun's setting and you know you only have so much time. And then finally, resources. So resources in this case represent consumables, allies, summonable entities, or any story cooldown ability. So. I use story cooldown ability to represent something like, this is an ability you have that you got through the course of the story and it has a huge cooldown. Like you can, I don't know, like use fireball once a week because you have permission to do so by a great wizard that has taken favor with you or some shit. And then separate from that is spell slots slash class features. Resources are important because the resource part of your combat encounter actually doesn't deal with just the encounter you're dealing with right now but resources are the tie-in to other combat encounters that you'll have in a session or even through the course of the story. So if you set up a combat encounter with a bunch of enemies that do high damage but are easy to kill, well, then you might hit healing resources. If you fight enemies that are like really close together, you might be able to get more of the higher level spell slots to deal damage, so on and so forth. And there's a lot of different ways that you can approach to essentially decide the level of attrition that your fights are going to have in the campaign you've made. So establish and maintain a consistent attrition throughout the game and the campaign that you're running. So what you don't want to do is suddenly like try to make a fight that the players are going to win, but like trying to entice them to use a bunch of their resources and stuff like that before they fight an actual boss, which they're supposed to have it for. You don't want to do that unless you have made precedent for that. Because regardless of how well that you present it story-wise, it's still a game and it's a game mechanic. So you have to keep that in mind. And that is a very basic explanation of formulas to design any combat encounter.